inna indeed we so what's that warning that Musa a.s. and Harun a.s. gave to Fir'aun that inna qad uhiya ilayna in fact it has been revealed to us meaning we're not saying this of our own accord we have not invented this stuff rather it has been revealed to us we have been taught by Allah what? that anna al-adhab that indeed the punishment is on who? ala man kathaba it is on the one who belied who denied the guidance that Allah has sent called it a lie watawalla and he turned away turned away from the guidance that Allah has sent he refusing to accept it so they said that Allah has revealed to us that punishment is prepared for who for those who reject the signs of Allah and turn away from his obedience and remember this is not just for Fir'aun and his people but rather it is for everybody that anyone who denies anyone who turns away he will face such an outcome in surah al-nazirat ayah 36 to 39 we learn wa burrizatil al-jahimu liman yara and hellfire will be exposed for all those who see fa amma man tagha wa athara al-hayat ad-dunya fa inna al-jahima hiya al-ma'wa so as for he who transgressed and preferred the life of the world, then indeed hellfire will be his refuge. For who? The one who transgressed and preferred the life of this world, meaning, كَذَّبَ وَتَوَلَّى Similarly in Surah Al-Layl, Ayah 14 to 16, we learn, فَأَنزَرْتُكُمْ نَارًا تَلَى اللَّهِ لَا يَصْلَاهَا إِلَّا الْأَشْقَى And who is Al-Ashqa? الَّذِي كَذَّبَ وَتَوَلَّى so I have warned you of a fire which is blazing and none will enter to burn therein except the most wretched one who had denied and turned away. The exact same words have been used over here. عَلَى مَنْ كَذَّبَ وَتَوَلَّى So Musa a.s. and Harun a.s. they went to Fir'aun and they told him. They delivered the message that Allah had commanded them to deliver to him. Now if you notice, if you go back, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأْتِيَاهُ فَقُولَا إِنَّا رَسُولَا رَبِّ Go to him and say this, this to him. Give him the message, give him the good news, and give him the warning. And then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the response of Fir'aun. قَالَ فَمَنْ رَبُّكُمَا يَا مُوسَى It hasn't been said, so Musa a.s. went and Harun went, and then they said this to him. Because it's quite understood from the context. This is the beauty of the Qur'an, that it's very brief. And where detail is necessary, detail is mentioned. Where it can be implied by the context, then unnecessary words have not been mentioned. Qala, he said, Fir'aun replied, that فَمَنْ رَبُّكُمَا So who is the Lord of you two? Ya Musa, O Musa. Now, on listening to all of this, what is he asking about? Who is your Lord? Did Musa a.s. say anything like that? What did he say? Let the Bani Israel go. May peace be on the one who follows the guidance. So he says, okay, so who is your Lord, O Musa? And notice, he addresses only Musa a.s. Whereas both of them had gone. Why did he address only Musa a.s.? Two reasons. Because firstly, Musa a.s. was the principal bearer of the message. Remember that Harun a.s. and Musa a.s. both were messengers. Musa a.s. prayed, وَأَشْرِكْهُ fi amri." Also make him a prophet. However, of the two, who was in charge? Musa a.s. And Harun a.s. was who? His wazir. وَجَعَلِّي وَزِيرًا مِنْ أَهْلِ هَارُونَ أَخِي So this shows to us that even if there are two people, even if there are two people who are doing some work together, from them, one should be clearly in charge. Clearly. That it's clear to both of them and it's clear to everybody else as well. That from these two people, who is in charge? Generally what happens? That if there are two people, we think, what's the big deal? We're just working together. But the fact is that even when there are two people, there has to be one in charge. Because otherwise there will be chaos. Like for example, even in a family, where there is a husband and a wife, there is an in charge. Isn't it? The man has been made the qawwam. Because if both become qawwam, then what will happen? Like it's happening today. Constant conflicts. Right? So one has to accept the superiority of the other. Otherwise, the car cannot move. There has to be one driver. 
Only one driver. Even if there are two people sitting in the car. One may be giving the directions. However, there is only one driver who makes the decision of whether we go right or left or we go straight. Secondly, he addressed only Musa a.s. because Fir'aun had reared Musa a.s. He had brought him up in his house and he knew Musa a.s. So when he asks him, Who is your Lord, O Musa? It's like as if he's implying, I am the one who brought you up. I am the one who took care of you. You grew up in this house and now you say you have another Lord besides me? You understand? Like for example, elsewhere in the Quran also we learned that Fir'aun said, Alam nurabbika fina walida. Did we not rear you up amongst us while you were walid, while you were a little infant, while you were a little baby? Did we not take care of you? And now you come and say you have another Lord besides us? Qala, Musa a.s. said, Rabbuna, our Lord, is Alladi, the one who a'ta kulla shay'in khalqahu, the one who gave each thing its form. So mahada, and then he guided it as well. So he tells him that our Lord is the khaliq and the hadi of every single thing that exists. Because Fir'aun also claimed to be God. Didn't he? But Musa a.s. describes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in such a way that these qualities Fir'aun did not have. These characteristics Fir'aun did not possess. And it was known to Fir'aun, it was known to everyone as well. Just as Ibrahim a.s. when he was speaking to Namrud, what did he say? That, Rabbi alladhi yuhi wa yumit. He gives life and he gives death. What did Namrud say? I also give life and I also give death. So what did Ibrahim a.s. say? That my Lord is the one who brings the sun from the east, so you bring it from the west. Right? So similarly over here, Musa a.s. said, رَبُّنَا الَّذِي أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ ثُمَّ هَدَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ Everything he has created and everything he has guided. Now this ayah has been understood in two ways. First of all, that الَّذِي أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ Meaning, that Allah is the one who gave kulla shay'in everything to who khalqahu to his khalq. Do you understand? That Allah is the one who has given everything to his creation. Meaning everything that is necessary for them. Everything that they need in order to survive. Every single thing that any creation needs, who has given it to it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for example, if the trees need oxygen, if the trees need sunlight, if the trees need some water, moisture, who has given it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, if fish need water to swim in, who has given that water to them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Similarly, in the body of everything that exists, whatever it needs, like the blood, or the bones, or the wings, or feet, or legs, or anything that any creation needs, who fulfill that need? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Summa hada, and then He also guided it. Guided it to what? To what it needs. So for example, let's say for leaves, for plants, sunlight is necessary. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided that sunlight. And then He has also guided the plants as to how to receive that sunlight. You may have noticed that if you have a plant inside your house, you will see the leaves turning towards the windows. Isn't it amazing? Who tells them, turn towards the window so you can get more sunlight? Who tells them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put this within the plants, right? So He has guided every creature as well as to how to get to what they need. Similarly, we see birds, that how they migrate in the winter to warmer areas, and then they come back. Now who has guided them that this is the way you fly to, and this is how you fly, this is what you're supposed to eat before you go, and this is where you can stop? Who guided them to all of this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So He has provided every creation what it needs, and He has also guided it as to how it should obtain it. Secondly, this ayah has been understood as, that رَبُّنَا الَّذِي أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ Meaning, he is the one who a'ta kulla khalqin khalqahu. 
So shay gives a meaning of khalq. Thing gives a meaning of creation that exists. So he has given every creation what? Khalqahu its khalq, meaning its form, its body, its appearance, its surah, the way it is. So every creation has been granted its own appearance, its own unique form that differentiates it from the rest. That differentiates it from the rest. So a'ta kulla shay'in, meaning kulla khalqin, khalqahu. So mahada, and then he has also guided every creation. Meaning he has also guided every creation, its function, its purpose, as to what it should do and how it should do. So for example, the trees. Who gave the trees their form? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he has also guided the function as to how they are supposed to function, when to grow, when to shed leaves. You know, for example, when winter comes, when fall comes, why do trees shed all of their leaves? We think because it's getting cold. So because of the cold, the leaves dry up and this is why they fall to the ground. Whereas if you think about it, there is water, there is sunlight. Why do they shed their leaves? Why? Because the tree knows that it cannot survive the winter while it has to feed so many leaves. So in order to survive, in order to go into survival mode, the trees begin to shed all of their leaves. So this is the hidayah that Allah has given to every creation. So أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ He has given every creation its form and then He has guided it to its function, how it's supposed to live, how it's supposed to grow, where it's supposed to grow, where it's supposed to live, how much is it supposed to grow, in which direction. So we are no ones to object. We are no ones to object that why is this tree like that? And why is this plant like that? And why is the grass like this? And why is this animal like this? We are no ones to object. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given every creation its form and He has also guided it to its purpose. And we see that كل شَيْءٍ includes every type of creation. It includes animals, it includes birds, it includes plants, it includes clouds, it includes angels, jinn, human beings, from the smallest of creation to the biggest of creation. Every creation Allah has guided. That He has given everything its unique form. And unique form is such that not even two flowers look identical. They might be very similar, very, very similar, but there will still be some differences, perhaps in the size, perhaps in the shape, perhaps in the number of petals. There still will be some slight differences. So every single creation, who has made it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot even count all of them. We cannot even number all of them. This is how complete His knowledge is, and this is how complete His power and ability is. Qala, Fir'aun said, such a beautiful explanation Musa a.s. gave, that if you begin to reflect upon this, there is no limit. Isn't it? If you begin to discuss this ayah, there is absolutely no limit, because kulla shayin khalqahu, this is endless. Right? Now Fir'aun, instead of reflecting upon this, he says, فَمَا بَالُ الْقُرُونِ الْأُولَى Then what is the case of the former generations? So you say this is the Lord of every single creation. Now what about all those people who came before us, our forefathers, who practiced idolatry, who did not worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What about them? What do you say about them? They're going to hellfire? Do you understand why he's asking? Why is he asking? To change the topic. And to also create fitna. To gain the support of his people and to turn his people against Musa a.s. That look, he says, your forefathers are going to hellfire. Imagine. Will you listen to him? Don't listen to him. I say they were right, so you give me support. Now, this is something very common. That you're talking to someone and all of a sudden somebody asks a question that is completely irrelevant completely irrelevant. It has nothing to do with the topic. And why do they ask? In order to create fitna. In order to turn people against the religion. In order to turn people against you. Now at that time, use wisdom. Just like Musa did. What does he say? 
قال علمها عند ربي في كتاب لا يضل ربي ولا ينسى it's knowledge is with my lord my lord does not forget nor does he make a mistake so Allah a'lam so in such situations what should you say Allah knows best for example you're sitting somewhere you're telling somebody about the deen and all of a sudden somebody comes and asks so what do you say about nail polish and you see everybody is wearing nail polish on their nails and if you say you can't pray with it then everybody will say how dare you say that right it's going to turn everybody against you I remember once I had gone for this lecture with my mother it was a group of students who had just graduated from college or something like that they had just received their degree and this lady comes in and she says could you please explain ayah number 59 of surah al-ahzab and that ayah is about niqab now these girls are graduating yes they're all looking extremely beautiful extremely pretty there might be non-mahram around why are you saying at this point that please explain the ayah about niqab it's not relevant to the subject at hand yes it's extremely important very important however it's not relevant over here so I remember that she just said that you could listen to a cassette on this ayah all the explanation is there and immediately she went back to the topic because if you say such offensive things to people or not necessarily offensive but even if you say something like you know what you're doing is wrong you shouldn't be dressed up like this people are not going to listen to you they're not going to be inclined to what you have to say at all you say one thing that goes against them and that's it they're going to get completely turned off from their religion so this is against hikmah and there are some people who deliberately bring such questions to create facade to turn people against you to turn people against their religion and this is exactly what Fir'aun did he asks a very controversial issue right he touches a very controversial topic that fama bal al qurun al ula now the word bal is from the root letters ba wa lam and it has two meanings first of all it means khabr what does khabr mean news information just as we learned in surah yusuf that yusuf alayhi salam asked fama bal al niswati right so what is the state of the women who try to seduce me. So bal is used for the present state, the present condition that someone is in. Like for example, it is asked, ma baluk, that how are you? What's your present state? What happened to you? What's going on? Okay. So fama balul quruni ula. What is the affair? What is the situation of the previous generations? Meaning, what is their current state right now? Where are they right now? Are they getting punished? Are they in hellfire? Are they being rewarded? What is their state? What is their present state? Secondly, the word bal is also understood as fikr, thought. Such a thought that passes through the mind of a person, that a person thinks about. Like for example, it is said, خَطَرَ بِبَالِي Meaning, I have thought about this. I had a thought. So, فَمَا بَالُ الْقُرُونِ الْأُولَى What is your thought about the previous people? What do you think about them? What is your opinion? Our forefathers, the previous people, what do you say about them? قَالَ Musa a.s. said, عِلْمُهَا It's knowledge, meaning the knowledge of their state, the knowledge of their present state, is عِنْدَ Rabbi. It's with my Lord, meaning Allahu A'lam. Now, did Musa a.s. not know the answer? That anyone who dies on shirk, his abode is hellfire, did he not know the answer? Of course he did. So why did he say this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows? Out of wisdom. Because if he gave the answer here, then what would people do? They would get turned against him. They would not listen to what he would have to say. It would create a lot of fitna. So we see that sometimes the truth is, you know, even if it's known to you, it does bite people, right? People don't want to listen to it. The truth always hurts. So, it doesn't mean that you should tell them something that is false. But what does it mean? That you don't openly say it because they're not ready to accept it. They're not ready to accept it at the moment. So at that time, what's the best way of getting yourself out of the situation. Saying, Allah knows best. Allah has full knowledge about it. He doesn't say, I don't know. Notice? He doesn't say, I have no idea. 
What does he say? Ilmuha in the Rabbi. Allah knows best. He is the judge. He knows his creation best. He is the most generous. He is the most just. And he is the one who decides. If I say something, if you say something, we are the ones to pass judgments. Judgment is completely in the hands of Allah. So ilmuha in the Rabbi fi kitab in the book. Which book is this? Lawhul Mahfuz. La yadillu Rabbi, my Lord does not err. He does not make a mistake. Meaning, he does not make a mistake with regards to where they dwelt, where they are buried, the kind of actions they did. He does not make a mistake with regards to that. Wala yansa, nor does he forget anything at all. So Allah knows, He is the best judge, and His knowledge is perfect. So in these situations, how should we get ourselves out of problem, or how do we save ourselves from turning people off from the deen? By referring the knowledge of it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Saying that Allah knows best. And then he goes on, explaining about who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Back to the topic. You see, somebody tries to say something completely irrelevant, go back to the topic. He says, الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ الْأَرْضَ مَهْدًا Who is your Lord? The one who has made for you the earth, mahdan, as a cradle, as a bed. Mahd is, from the root letters, meme hadal, and mahd is a suitable place for resting, a suitable place for residence. أَلَمْ نَجْعَلِ الْأَرْضَ مِهَادًا So he has made the earth for you a mahd, a bed, a cradle, meaning it's perfectly fit for you to live in, it's perfectly fit for you to rest in. وَالسَّلَكَ لَكُمْ And he has inserted for you. فِيهَا In it, meaning in the earth, subulan pathways, roadways. Salaka is from the root letter seen lam kaf, and salaka is to enter upon a course and continue to walk upon it. And then it is used for, it's both lazim and mutaaddi, so it is used for inserting something, making something enter upon a path, upon a course. So salaka lakum, meaning he has channeled, he has threaded, he has paved for you in the earth subulan. Pathways, meaning natural pathways through mountains, through valleys, so that you can get from one place to the other. You can travel easily. In Surah Al-Anbiya, Ayah number 31, we learn, وَجَعَلْنَا فِيهَا فِجَاجًا سُبُلًا لَعَلَّهُمْ يَهْتَدُونَ We have made there in mountain passes as roads that they might be guided. وَأَنزَلَ And he has sent down مِنَ السَّمَاءِ From the sky, ma and water. How? In the form of rain. In Surah Al-Nahl, Ayah 10, we learn, هُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً لَكُمْ مِنْهُ شَرَابٌ وَمِنْهُ شَجَرٌ فِيهِ تُسِيمُونَ That from this water that comes down, you drink from it, and through it is also the growth of various plants, شَجَرٌ فِيهِ تُسِيمُونَ In which you pasture your animals. فَأَخْرَجْنَا So we brought out بِهِ with it, meaning through this water we have produced أَزْوَاجًا Pairs, kinds. Min of nabatin plants that are shatta, that are different, that are diverse, various. Azwaj is a plural of zawj, and zawj is one of a pair. But remember that azwaj is also used for kinds, anwa, different kinds of something. So he has produced through the rain water from the earth, he has produced different kinds, different categories of Plants, vegetation, that are shatta, that are various. Shatta is a plural of shatit, from the root letter shin tata. And shatit is one that is different from the other. And shatta, as a plural, is used for the various different parts of one thing. The various different parts of one thing. As a whole, it's one. As a category, it's one. But it has several components. And these components may also differ from one another. Like for example about the Yahud we learn, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تَحْسَبُهُمْ جَمِيعًا وَقُلُوبُهُمْ شَتَّى You think that they are together, but in reality their hearts are shatta. They are split up. They are diverse. They appear to be one. They have the same faith. However, they are diverse. They are different from one another. So, azwajam min nabat in shatta, what does it mean together? That he has produced categories of various plants. You understand? Categories of various plants. 
So Nabat and Shatta have various plants. Like for example, one is a vine, one is a tree, one is grass, another is, you know, small shrubs. But from the shrubs, from the grass, from the trees, from the vines also he has made what? Azwaj. Different, different kinds. So you understand? That it's not that there's monotony in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That they all resemble one another. They're boring. No. That He has created different kinds of plants. And within the different kinds also He has made various categories. For example, you have a category of fruit trees. But within the fruit trees you have apples and then you have pears. Within the apples you have different types of apples. Within the pears you have different types of pears. So much variety He has created. This is who Allah is. Now again He gives such a description that is nowhere in Fir'aun. It's not at all in Fir'aun. It's only in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah Fatir, Ayah 27, we learn, أَلَمْ تَرَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ أَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً فَأَخْرَجْنَا بِهِ ثَمَرَاتٍ مُخْتَلِفًا أَلْوَانُهَا Do you not see that Allah sends down rain from the sky and we produce thereby fruits of varying colors? So it's not just that they differ in their characteristics, in their appearance, but it's also in their colors, in their tastes, in their textures. Kulu, all of you eat. Warau, and pasture. An'amakum, your livestock. This ayah, some have understood it to be the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressing the people of Makkah because they were being told about the story of Musa alayhi salam. And some have said that this is a continuation of what? Musa a.s. was saying to Fir'aun and his people that kulu war'u an'amakum eat yourself of the various plants that Allah has created and at the same time ir'u an'amakum also make your grazing livestock eat when you eat you will benefit when your animals will eat again who will benefit you will benefit and the word war'u is from the root letters ra'inya ra'i Ra'yun is to look after a living creature. It is to look after a living creature. Does it require more work? Does it? For example, you have a table and you have a cat. Who requires more work from you? Your cat. Your table, okay, you'll dust it once in a while, you'll clean it with a wet cloth. That's it. But your cat, you have to feed it. You have to do so many things for the cat. So this is what ra'i is, to look after a living being. And looking after a living being involves two things. First of all, feeding it. And secondly, protecting it as well. That you have to protect it from dangers, from threats. This is why the word ra'i is used for a shepherd. Who is a shepherd? He feeds his grazing livestock animals and at the same time he also protects them. He also preserves them. So kulu warau an'amakum over here ir'u gives a meaning of feed feed your grazing livestock mata'an lakum wa li an'amikum inna fi dhalika la ayat indeed in that are surely signs for who li ulinuha for the possessors of intelligence for those people who have nuha nuha is the plural of nuhiya nuhiyatun nun ha ya tamabuta Nuhiyatun. And nuhiyah is used for intelligence, for understanding, reason. Any other word from the same root? Nahi. What does nahi mean? To stop, to forbid. So what does reason do? It stops you from doing something wrong. It stops you from taking a wrong step. So the aql, the intellect of a person, the one that is sound, the one that is salim, what does it do? It stops a person from committing wrong things. From the same root, naha. Naha is to reach the maximum of something. Intiha, to reach the maximum point of something. And nahuwa yanhu is to be very intelligent. So, nuhiya is such intellect that is kamil, that is very good, that is complete such intelligence that is very good because of it he takes the right steps and he stays away from doing wrong things and this comes with experience 
This comes with having a lot of knowledge. So those people who have good reason, those people who are really intelligent, who really have some understanding, for them there are signs in this. Minha khalaqanakum. From it we have created you. From what? From this ard. From which we created and brought out all these plants that you eat and also your animals eat. So minha khalaqanakum. From it we have created you. How? How have we been created from the earth? That our origin, meaning Adam alayhi salam, he was created from the earth. He was created from Turab. And secondly, from it we created you how? That our nutrition comes from where? Our food comes from where? From the earth. What do we eat? Either plants or animals. And both of them come from the earth. The animals, where do they take their nutrition from? From the earth. And what we eat becomes a part of our body. Isn't it so? It becomes a part of us. So, minha khalaqnakum from the earth we have created you. Wa fiha nuridukum and in it we will return you. Meaning, once you have completed your term of life, you will be returned to where? Where? Back to the earth, under the soil. Wa minha nukhrijukum and from it we will bring you out. When? At the time of resurrection, on the day of judgment. Taratan ukhra, another time. Tara from the root letters Tayara. And Tara is like Karra, time. So we will take you out of the earth at another time. We learned that there was once a companion who passed away. And when the people buried him, the Prophet ﷺ, he took a handful of dust to throw it onto the grave. Because when a person is buried, you have to cover the grave with mud, right? So he took a handful of dust and he threw it onto the grave in order to cover it. The first time he threw a handful of earth, he said, Minha khalaqnakum. And then he took another handful and he threw it and he said, Wa fiha nuridukum. And he took another handful and he threw it and he said, Wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra. So this earth is our beginning. And we will be returned back into this earth. So why assume arrogance for the short while that we're Walking on the surface of the earth. Think about it. We were a part of this soil, and then after some time, again we will become a part of the soil. For the few moments that we're walking on the surface of the soil, we become so arrogant. It doesn't befit human beings. In Surah Al A'raf, Ayah 25, we learn, "Qala fiha tahyuna, wa fiha tamutuna, wa minha tukhrajun." He said. In it you will live, meaning in the earth you will live, and therein you will die, and from it you will be brought forth. We learn in Surah Al-Mursalat, Ayah 25 and 26, أَلَمْ نَجْعَلِ الْأَرْضَ كِفَاتًا أَحْيَاءً وَأَمْوَاتًا Have we not made the earth a container? A container of the living and the dead. That in this earth are the living beings, and in this earth are the dead ones as well. That from it come the living and they go back into the earth when they die. This is our reality. And these are the signs, these were the evidences that were given to Fir'aun. We listen to the recitation and then we'll continue. We see that Musa a.s. he prayed to Allah that, Rabbi shrahli sadri. That, O oh Allah, you open my heart for me and tell me what to say, make me understand, give me the confidence. And when Musa a.s. came to speak to Fir'aun, look at his confidence. That when Fir'aun is trying to make him slip, make him say even one thing that the people will be very offended by, look, he does not forget the wisdom. Look at the way he responds. So this is the help of Allah, which comes to a person when he relies upon Allah and not himself. Musa a.s. didn't think, yes, I must be very smart that Allah chose me. He still realizes that he is weak. So he prays to Allah, Rabbi shrahli sadri. And both of them pray that, Inna nakhafa, we fear that Fir'aun is going to become very oppressive against us. So when a person prays to Allah, then Allah will protect him. And the wisdom in the way that Musa a.s. did da'wah, that he mentioned, ayat kawni, which are visible to everyone, from which they can relate to, which they can see, and no one can reject them. We see over here, 
that Musa a.s. said to Fir'aun that لا يضل ربي ولا ينسى My Lord does not make a mistake nor does He forget. And this is in the context it's about that He does not forget any person, any of His actions, what He's done. So in other words, He's fully aware and He is the best judge. But we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forget. And there are people who when they forget Allah, Allah forgets them. Forgetting them means that Allah does not care about them. And if you notice in the following ayat what is mentioned, the signs of Allah. If you remember Allah, He will remember you. And if you ignore Him, He will ignore you. And فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلَ لَيِّنًا This is extremely important. And at the same time, it's also very difficult. That many times it happens, you're talking to someone and they may be older than you. Perhaps they're your own parents. And they begin scolding you. And they begin to say something harsh to you. And at that time, if you become the same, if you start yelling at them, if you start arguing with them, then what's the difference between you and them? And always remember that the person whom you're talking to, okay, they know less than you. Perhaps they're not believers. But at the same time, they have some kind of self-respect. Some kind of respect that other people give them. That perhaps Allah has given them. And if you don't acknowledge that, then they're not going to listen to you. Like for example... The emperor of Rome, the Prophet ﷺ called him Arzim al-Rum, didn't he? He didn't say anything else. I mean, he accepted his status. And this is a part of Qawl al Similarly, if it's your mother, if it's your parents, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told you to respect them. So regardless of how they behave with you, how they speak to you, you have to be gentle. And always remain focused on the topic. That many distractions will come, people will start talking to you, they will try to distract you, but always remain focused. And this is something that we see in Musa a.s. And he was told, لا تنيا في ذكري. And see that constantly, who is he mentioning? Who is he talking about? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because sometimes when we're doing da'wah, we forget who we're calling people to. We start projecting ourselves, we start projecting a person, we start projecting a place. Whereas the fact is that we are calling people to Allah. So Allah should remain the center of all the discussion. And qawla layyin, again, in the way that he's giving them warning, that inna qad uhiya ilayna anna al-adaba ala man kathaba wa tawalla. That if you look at the wording, he doesn't say that Allah will punish such and such and he is shadid al-iqab and uh, there is hellfire and there is such kind of punishment prepared over there. Wisdom, qawla layyinan. Because warning can also be given by gentle words. And fear is something very natural. Especially fear of facing people. Fear of talking to people. Talking to people who will oppose you. It's very natural. But at the same time, a person should have some trust upon Allah. That they said, Inna nakhafu, we are afraid. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, La takhafa. Because I am with you. And I hear you and I watch you. And nobody can harm you. Nobody can do anything anything harmful to you. So have trust upon me. So we see that when it comes to da'wah, a person must have trust upon Allah. Without this trust, he cannot do anything. He cannot say the right things, he cannot face the difficult situation. He won't be able to do anything. It's a trust of Allah that gives confidence to a person. And we see over here, إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِأُولِ النُّهَا For those people who have intellect, who have intelligence, for them there are signs in this. Now sometimes, what is it that clouds the intellect? What is it that blocks it? It's arrogance. And arrogance is refuted in the following ayat. That you have come from the earth and you're going to go back in it. Why be arrogant then? Remember your origin and remember your end. And one more very important thing, that where Musa a.s. he introduces Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Fir'aun and he says, that رَبُّنَا الَّذِي أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ ثُمَّ هَدَى So in a way, indirectly, this statement is saying that if every single creature is functioning the way it is supposed to function, it knows its purpose, every single thing, then the human being, should he not know his purpose? If Allah has guided the plants that they should face the sun, if Allah has guided the birds to fly a certain direction, if Allah has guided the water that it should flow in a certain direction, then will Allah not guide the human being as to what he should do, as to who he should worship, what the purpose of his life is? Of course he will. 
We'll listen to the recitation and then we'll continue. <laughs> 